Welcome back. In this lecture, I'll be talking about the Amish. There are several reasons for talking about the Amish, not the least of which is that we have a relatively large Amish population around us in Indiana. In fact, we are the third largest population of Amish in Indiana in the world. Uh, so not only do we have those who are still practicing, but there are a number of people who leave the Amish and remain in the area. And they may not be as obvious, but they are still impacted by the sect and by that, influ that cultural influence, even as adults, even having left. And so knowing that that's their background makes a difference in how we need to approach them as clients. So for several reasons, it's important to know how to work with the Amish, whether they're coming in as Amish clients, whether they're coming in as persons who were previously Amish. Also, because this is an area where I do have a fairly in-depth expertise, I spend a little more time on it. I don't think you'll get as much information from other areas of the program as you will from me. Uh, in 2014, I published a book through Johns Hopkins University Press called Serving the Amish. It's a manual, in essence, for persons in any helping profession uh, who are working with the Amish and who want background and also specific information uh, for their area of expertise, be it law enforcement, health care, mental health, social services on how to deal with the Amish. And in September, October of this year, 2020, uh, Johns Hopkins will also be releasing Serpent in the Garden, Amish Sexuality in a Changing World. And that will be exactly that, looking at Amish sexuality and talking about their experience there. So I do have those two books. I also have several journal articles out on the Amish. Uh, and that's been my experience. I've worked with a substance abuse program in Elkhart LaGrange for Amish youth in Rumspringa. And I've worked with a domestic violence program for Amish women, again in Elkhart LaGrange, and was helpful in facilitating that program. So also done counseling with the Amish, psychological testing with the Amish significant background in that respect. All right, let's talk about then the Amish. And the first question is, who are they? And the cardinal rule I would start with is that talking about the Amish is a misnomer. There really is no the Amish. It's a little bit talking about, like talking about the Catholics. Uh, worldwide, we can say there is the Catholic Church, but then the Catholics who fall under that church are so radically different based on where we're talking about they are. Same thing is true of the Amish. There are several Amish groups and affiliations. For purposes of this lecture, I'm going to call them all Amish and not try to parse them very far. Uh, they're sufficiently similar for purposes of a counseling interaction that we don't necessarily need to. And if differences arise, you'll be able to familiarize yourself with that client, and those differences will express themselves over time. So you'll figure out what they are. So I'm going to discuss in a moment things that are general to all Amish groups. But I do want you to recognize that there are different groups even in this area. So let's step back for a moment, talk about where the Amish come from, where are their roots, because this is very, very important to the Amish themselves, their historical background. More so than for most of us, their roots are very important to them. And their story begins in the 16th century, in the 1500s. Uh, there was the Protestant Reformation, there was defiance of the Catholic Church. We think of leaders like Martin Luther, and John Calvin, but the medieval state church system 
was being questioned by a small and radical group. At that time, the state and the church were in essence one and the same. There was very little difference between government and church. They operated together. And dissenters began to defy the idea that the blessed and civil military authority could go hand in hand. And that's particularly where they argued that the idea that these two things could be in union. And these dissenters believed that the true church was composed of those who separated from corrupting influences and followed the teachings of Jesus. And so they began to separate themselves from the government. They began to separate themselves from the, the church by doing so. And they wanted to live humbly. And they rejected violence, even in self-defense. They became non-resistant. And this was a major, major change at that point in time. If you, if you think of um, people in the Idaho compounds today who say, we're not part of the United States. That's in essence what these dissenters were saying in the 1500s. We are not part of the country in which we live. These dissenters also rejected infant baptism. Again, the Catholic Church uh, believed that baptism was necessary for salvation, so baptizing an infant was essential. These dissenters said baptism should be a conscious choice. And so they rejected their baptism as infants and insisted on being baptized again as adults. And they were called Anabaptists or rebaptizers for those dissenters who said that there needed to be a second baptism. That's where Anabaptist comes from. Some of these Anabaptists were known as Mennonites thanks to their leader, Menno Simons. He was an Anabaptist leader in the Netherlands. So Menno Simons, the Mennonites, one of these groups that comes out in the Netherlands. And there is a lot of persecution. We know the history of the Protestant Reformation. But by the late 1600s, persecution is beginning to wane. There is not as much persecution. In point of fact, Anabaptists are not only tolerated, but in places they're admired for their work ethic, for their stance, for their ability to withstand persecution. The tide is really turning in favor of the Anabaptists by the late 1600s. Jacob Amon comes along, and Jacob Amon is born in 1644. And he converts to Anabaptism and is ordained. Now he's moving in, sorry, he's living in Switzerland. And he moves to Alsace, which is what is now France. alsace lorraine is an area of France these days. Anabaptists in those areas had originally moved there to avoid persecution from the world. It was isolated, it was rural, and they felt like they could separate themselves and more closely follow the mission of Christ if they weren't being influenced by the world. And so that's where they wanted to be. But Amon was alarmed by the tendency of Anabaptist to accept the world's embrace. He saw Anabaptist um, becoming prideful because the world admired them. He saw Anabaptist uh, enjoying the fact that they had this celebrity status. And he began to argue, again, for an Anabaptist rejection of the world. He wanted to see that renewed. And in so doing, he reinstituted a practice that had somewhat fallen out of favor with the Mennonites, but he wanted to see it done again, and it's called shunning. And it continues today, and it is a primary core tenet of Amish life. Shunning, excommunication, both mean the same thing. Uh, it's fascinating to watch in practice. Shunning means that a member of the Amish community, 
or someone who should be a member of the Amish community but has not yet made that decision. When we're talking about young people who have gotten old enough, they should be joining the church but they haven't, are restricted from full fellowship with the community. Depending on the settlement, depending on the geographic group of Amish, which is a settlement, it will play out in different ways. Uh, I have seen it played out in a group meeting where everyone brings a dish, but someone who is shunned is served from a different container so that they have their own separate containers. And it's very discreetly done, but they have their own container there so that they are not served from the containers that people who are not shunned are being served from. Um, I've seen two tables put together and covered by a tablecloth but there's a space between the two tables and someone who is shunned is sitting at the other table. So they're not fellowshipping at the same table with persons who are in good standing with the Amish. Uh, it just depends on how people want to carry on the shunning, how it's done. Right. Sometimes shunning is more severe. And a person who is shunned is not even allowed in the home of someone in good standing with the Amish. It just all depends. Okay, this is what Jacob Amon was really about, was returning to the idea of shunning. And that's where he took his people and split from the Mennonites over the issue of shunning and became the Amish church. So the Amish broke from the Mennonites, became a much more conservative group called the Amish after Jacob Amon. Right. They remain primarily at that point in Alsace, in France. Things are going reasonably well until the early 1700s when the French royalty changes its attitude toward having the Amish there. We go from admiration to, again, a sense that the Amish are being persecuted. That may have been due to their non-resistance. Um, as you see the French beginning to fight wars, they need men to fight and in, in be part of the French army. And the Amish are saying, no, thank you, we're non-resistant. The attitude of the French may have hardened toward them. But whatever the cause, the Amish were ordered expelled from Alsace. And their displacement, obviously, led to migration to other areas. So through the 1700s, you see the Amish immigrating to Pennsylvania. Uh, William Penn offered religious tolerance to the Amish among others. So this is the first place or one of the first places in America that the Amish came was to Pennsylvania. And then they began migrating westward. So you see the move from Pennsylvania to Ohio, Indiana, on into Illinois, on into Iowa. And you see that just westward progression of the Amish. Then in the early 18, to mid 1800s, there's another wave of Amish immigrants that come directly from Switzerland. And they moved into the Midwest in Ontario. They didn't stop in Pennsylvania. So we have two sets of migration. When you look at Elkhart, LaGrange, and Napanee, and the settlements there, you are looking at Amish who moved from Pennsylvania to Ohio, on into Indiana, and that first wave of westward migration from Alsace and France, in France, that's the group that moved that way. When you look in Grable, when you look in Bern, when you look in Davis County, you are looking at Amish who moved in the 1850s directly from Switzerland into Indiana. And they are a different group in the sense that they're Swiss Amish, still Amish, but very different in their way 
from the Elkhart and Lagrange Amish. So, different culturally in several ways. Right. In the mid 1800s, there comes a crisis of conscience again among all these Amish. And there's a feeling that there's too much change. And remember the Amish exist because Jacob Amon decided there was too much change and wanted to separate from the Mennonites. So the, the Mennonites were becoming too lax. Well, the Amish believe again, there's too much change. There's, they're becoming too lax in the mid 1800s. About two thirds of the Amish at that point continue to drift and allow the change to occur, but they end up assimilated into Mennonite congregations. So they go back to the Mennonites they came from, and the remaining third follow the old order, the old Amish order of things, and came to be called Old Order Amish. And that's also your first lecture question. About mid-1800s, two-thirds of the Amish continue to drift and are assimilated in, back into the Mennonites. The remainder came to be called Old Order Amish. Now, even among the old order, there continues to be fractures. So you have the old order, the new order, the Nebraska Amish, the Andy Weaver Amish, the Swartzen Troopers. And all of these, like Andy Weaver and Swartzen Troopers, are named after the, the bishops that led them out. But all of these continue to be Amish. These are different forms of Amish, different groups of Amish. But the old order remains the largest group. And the old order is what we have primarily in Elkhart Lagrange, in Bern, in Grable. We're talking about Old Order Amish there. Right. One of the biggest splits again occurred in 1910, and approximately two thirds of the Amish in Pennsylvania left over the decision not to allow telephones in the home. And nationwide, it became a major issue that telephones were allowed. Eventually, the compromise occurred that telephones were allowed in telephone shacks out by the road. If you've been through Amish country, uh, at least in Grable, Bern, you've seen telephone shacks out by the road where a family will share a telephone or several families will share a telephone. But that was the compromise. Telephone could be there, but it couldn't be in, in the house. And that's, that's what occurred. But again, caused a major split. Our understanding of the Amish comes from two primary sources. And they're behind me on the shelf here, actually. Uh, Hostetler and Cravel. Hostetler wrote Amish Society. And Cravel, Don Cravel, Karen Johnson Weiner and Steve Nolt wrote The Amish. Hostetler's book went through four editions into the 1970s, started in the 19, early 1960s, I believe, and went through the 1970s. Hostetler wrote as a sociologist. His father was Amish and ended up being shunned and excommunicated. But Hostetler kept a very close affiliation with the Amish, a very close affinity, and was very supportive, and wrote about the Amish as a, as a culture, as a society, and, and really wrote about a folk society in his mind. Um, and his perspective was that of a folk society, kind of a charming, quaint people. And when he writes about them, you get that sense. Crable, Johnson Weiner, and Note, when they write about the Amish, write more from a, a modern sociological, anthropological perspective. There's more of a disinterested, uh, scientific observation of the Amish than what you find with Hostetler. But theirs, Hostetler's and Crable's views of the Amish are the views that we have of Amish society today. It remains to be seen. Crable has recently retired. He is a professor emeritus now at Elizabethtown College, where he was uh, ran basically the, the Young Center for 
Anabaptist and Pietist studies. It remains to be seen whether we're going to, to see further diversification in the field and whether other scholars will come up with other ways of seeing the Amish. Uh, Don Crable mentored me, so I have the Crable view of the Amish, to be perfectly honest. So I'm not really, other than the, the, the Crable fold, uh, it's going to be interesting because there really needs to be more diversity, more people talking about and looking at the Amish from different perspectives for there to be healthy debate about understanding the culture, and it's just not there right now. All right. When we interpret Amish culture, however, from the perspective we have, one of the issues that comes up is the Amish view of modernity. And when we talk about modernity, and now we're into post-modernity, but when we talk about modernity, modernity emphasizes rationality and efficiency. We, we prize science and technology. The greater the speed, the greater the increased, increased quantity of production, the greater the self-evident good. We don't need to justify it on anything else other than the fact that it's obviously better, faster. It's better because it's faster. So that's all we need to know. As a byproduct of this modernity, life becomes segmented and broken into separate parts. Uh, we have, you know, we, we do this here, we do that there. We go to the grocery store, we go to the hardware store, we work here uh, in this building, we have work friends, we have friends we socialize with, our family is broken up all over the country. Uh, we have Facebook friends, we have other friends here, we go to church, synagogue, or the mosque here, and we have people we socialize with here, but they're not part of our life in other areas. Very, very segmented in the way and compartmentalized in the way our life is lived. The Amish don't reject that, but they compromise with modernity whenever possible. And Crable in particular has come up with a metaphor of negotiating with modernity. So in his metaphor, the Amish either accept, reject, or compromise with modernity. And it's that latter point, when they compromise, that we find so compelling. So, for example, some, event, some events that they compromise with will, um, the horse and buggy, are classic symbols of the Amish. Their compromise with vehicles is that they don't own cars, they don't own trucks, they don't own a motor vehicle. Rather, they use a horse and buggy because a horse and buggy keeps them confined geographically to this uh, limited area so that their kinship networks, their family involvement, their Friendship involvements or social involvements are limited geographically to the settlement, to an Amish settlement, a geographic area. But the compromise is they can rent taxis. They can rent and use motor vehicles when they need them to get somewhere else. So their compromise with modernity is we won't own motor vehicles, but we're more than welcome to use them when we need them to get somewhere. So that's a compromise that they put into place. They don't fully accept it. They don't fully reject it. They compromise. That's one example. So several compromises that they've come up with, uh, one that directly impacts us, they have come up with residential facilities on community mental health center grounds that offer uh, services for Amish who need mental health services. Uh, the closest one to us is at Oaklawn in Goshen. It's called Rest Haven. It is a treatment center 
on the grounds of Oak Lawn. It is run by the Amish. It is there, but the Amish go to group therapy and to individual sessions at Oak Lawn at the Community Mental Health Center. They receive psychiatric services and medication at Oak Lawn at the Community Mental Health Center. But they are on site in a residential center staying for several weeks to several months if they need it, getting the care they need, and then returning back to their community. And in the entire time they're getting the care they need, they are receiving it from Amish house parents, Amish staff, and Amish director at Rest Haven, all in conjunction with Oakland. Same process goes on out in Pennsylvania at Phil Haven, which is their community mental health center, and they have a facility called Green Pasture. And then in Ohio, it's actually a standalone facility that's not connected with the community mental health center, but it's the same principle. Right. Um, you see, Wisconsin, Wisconsin versus Yoder it was a 1972 decision through the United States Supreme Court. The Amish, through the 1950s, simply placed their kids in public school. Public schools were small, tended to be one room or two room schools. In the 1960s, you see schools beginning to consolidate and become huge elementary schools, huge middle schools, you know, huge high schools. The Amish didn't want their kids in those, so they're pulling their kids out by eighth grade. Schools are more and more insisting that education needs to at least be through the 12th grade, and the Amish are resisting this. Schools begin to fight back. They begin, many school boards begin arresting Amish fathers who don't send their kids to school and the Amish started um, fighting court cases in various states, but the one that went all the way to the Supreme Court was Wisconsin versus Yoder et al. There were several Amish fathers who were involved. And the Supreme Court weighed in on the side of the Amish and said, it is a religious freedom to only have children in school through the eighth grade. So that is how Amish children are allowed to leave school after the eighth grade. Interestingly enough, there are former Amish now who are fighting that and feel that that is discriminating against the Amish children uh, and forcing them to stay in Amish culture when if they had more schooling, they would be able to get out. So some pushback these days to that. The National Steering Committee is another compromise with modernity that the Amish have made. Eighth grade schooling is a compromise with modernity. National Steering Committee came about because the Amish needed some way, if they're non-resistant, they're not going to sue, they're not going to fight in court, but they needed some way to combat issues that come up with the government, um, with whoever. So when it came to issues like the draft, when it came to issues like hard hats on construction sites, uh, particularly when OSHA came about, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, uh, there is a national committee which is composed of one member from each state where there are Amish who meet on a regular basis and talk about what needs to be done, what the major issues are, and then meet with OSHA, meet with government regulators, meet with attorneys, and talk about what the Amish concerns are as a focal point to address the religious rights that the Amish feel are being uh, trampled or neglected in these issues. And they have dealt with issues such as hard hats, issues such as conscientious objectors, issues such as um, you know requirements for building codes, all sorts of things over the years. So that's the National Steering Committee. All right. Cell phones. They are ubiquitous, necessary for employment. They're easily hidden, which makes them a problem for the Amish. Cell phones themselves probably could have been tolerated and would not have been seen as a major issue. Cell phones, once they were connected online, became a much larger issue because they bring so many Amish 
directly to the world and the world directly to the Amish. I don't know how the cell phone issue is going to end up playing out. Lots of Amish leadership, ministers and bishops who are their clergy, their, their leadership, argue against the cell phone. Say it doesn't need to exist, say it needs to be out of Amish homes, doesn't change the fact that it's there for lots and lots of Amish. So you also see in technology that they don't use electricity off the grid. It means they don't connect to public utilities for their electricity. However, their use of uh, kerosene, the use of white gas, has uh, gone down dramatically, and they're using more and more batteries because batteries have become more and more sophisticated, more and more long-lasting. And so they have more ability to recharge cell phones. They have more and more ability to live with electricity off the grid. Um, solar panels are more frequently seen on Amish homes. Um, so electricity is becoming more and more of a compromise that the Amish are embracing and finding non-public utility ways to incorporate electricity into their homes. Right. All sorts of ways that the Amish find to negotiate with modernity. And those change the culture as those changes occur and they have to make those adjustments. All right. How about statistics? What do we know? These are 2019 Amish population estimates. As of right now, I don't think the 2020 population estimates are out. But we, we know that Nationwide and in Canada, we have a little over 300 or about 340,000 Amish total. There are a couple of settlements in South America. Those have been tried before and have failed. I don't know if these settlements will last or not, to be honest. In Indiana, we have close to 60,000 Amish, as you can see from the statistics. And then we are, again, the, the third largest state. Pennsylvania right now is the largest state. Pennsylvania and Ohio go back and forth about who has the most Amish. It, it kind of varies from year to year. But right now, it's Pennsylvania, or was last year. Uh, and you can see then, going down from there, other states that have significant numbers of Amish. Again, these are varying. Some, some are old order Amish. When you look at that New York number, for example, of 20, almost 21,000, uh, a lot of those are Schwarzenegger Amish, who are a different branch. So it just depends on where you are. And a lot of those Michigan Amish, by the way, are just over the line from Elkhart and LaGrange. So they're counted in Michigan, but in essence, they're part of the Elkhart and LaGrange settlement. So. All right. Uh, so how do, I've talked about the Amish negotiating with modernity, but Crable describes this better than I can. And this is a video segment where Don Crable talks about the Amish compromise with modernity. And I'm going to let him speak to it now. I would say um, the the central uh, the central question that I've been intrigued about with Amish life, uh, which I think is the central question, it's the thread that's woven through all of my works uh, related to the Amish, as well as other old order groups like on the back road to heaven and horse and buggy Mennonites and so on. Um, the, the central question is, how is it possible for traditional communities that reject television, that reject higher education, that reject the ownership of automobiles, that reject computers, how is it possible in North America, in postmodern North America, how is it possible for communities like that to not only survive, but to thrive? To me, that is a very interesting intellectual question. Uh, what 
what do they have to do? What are they doing in terms of their ideology? What are they doing in terms of their social practices? What are they doing in terms of their value system to enable themselves to not only uh, survive, but thrive? Why aren't they dying out like the, Quake, the Shakers? Um, and maybe some of the Quakers. <laughs> Um, so to me, that's a really fascinating question. And I think I've come at that in various ways in different books, looking at their business practices, looking at their conflict with the state and the Amish and the state, looking at um, various practices. And it's the riddle I really begin with in 1989 in the riddle of Amish culture. I mean, that's exactly what the riddle is. How is it possible for a tradition-laden group like the Amish, who only selectively use technology, who limit education, how is it possible for them to not only survive, but to thrive in a postmodern, hypermodern, high-tech, high-sped world? I think it's very difficult to predict the future of the Amish, um, you know, in, 19, in 2014 or 2015. Um, I think during the course of my studies, uh, let's say from 1980 uh, up to the present, the Amish have been thriving in terms of their population numbers. What I expect is going to happen in the future is a, a, a much greater rate of differentiation of enormous diversity. I think the ones that are most threatened by uh, high technology are moving to more rural areas in states where they are much more insulated, where they're much more isolated. And I think that version of Amish will probably thrive for a considerable amount of time. I think those that are in um, business, uh, those that are using a lot of technology, increasingly, those are going to uh, change pretty rapidly. And whether they will keep calling themselves Amish or not, I don't know. Whether they keep using horse and buggy, I don't know. Uh, some of them, as groups, may eventually morph into uh, car driving groups like Beachy Amish or, or others. Uh, I do think there's going to be much more diversity on the whole spectrum of Amish life. And the most traditional ones, the most conservative ones, the most rural ones are most likely going to maintain uh, what we think of as traditional Amish practices long term. Let's talk about collective culture, church hierarchy, and female submission. When we talk about collective culture, church hierarchy, and female submission, we're talking about three interwoven concepts. Uh, but we're also essentially integrating them with the fourth, fourth concept I'm going to introduce momentarily. So what are some practices that are common to all Amish groups when we consider this? As a starting point, we've got rural residents. All Amish groups are in rural areas. That's a preference. They want to stay separate from the world. Traditionally, they're agrarian. That has gone by the wayside. They, most groups can't make it farming anymore. Some do uh, dairy farming if they can, but most of the time they're not doing farming as, as their way of making money. But they still prefer to be in rural areas where they can be geographic settlements unto themselves. They use a German-based dialect in the home. English is a second language. It's not always the same German dialect. Uh, the German dialect used by Amish in Bern and Grebel is different from the German dialect used by the Elkhart and Lagrange Amish. And in point of fact, they can't understand each other when they use a German dialect. So Elkhart and Lagrange, to speak to the Swiss Amish in Bern and Grebel, have to use English. But they're both German dialects. Education is normally limited to the eighth grade, as I mentioned earlier. 
you can find exceptions. Um, you can find teachers who have a GED or an HSE. Um, sometimes they will have that. Sometimes just because they want to, an Amish person will go through high school. It's more likely to be in Elkhart and LaGrange than it is down here in Burning Grable. Burning Grable, the Swiss Amish are more conservative, but you can find an exception to any rule there. The church. The church is also called the Gamay, G-M-A-Y, the Gamay. And the church is the people, not a building, never, never a building really with, with the Amish. And services are held in homes. And these are small local churches without any kind of overarching organization. A church is a geographic district. If you live within a particular area in a settlement, your church will be a number of families within that geographic district. Your only choice about leaving that church is to literally physically move out of that geographic district. The ministry is a lay ministry. The ministers are chosen by lot. The minister has to be a married man in good standing in the church. The way those choices are made is that every married man has the opportunity, if there's an opening for a minister, and usually there are two ministers, a deacon and a bishop, if there's an opening for a deacon or a minister, everyone in the congregation, women and men, who are members of the church have an opportunity to nominate someone for the open position of deacon, open position of minister. Usually the top three or four candidates in terms of nominations will be selected. They are then asked to sit on the front bench. Benches are put out in a barn or in a basement or in a shed for the service. They're asked to sit on the front bench and the corresponding number of hymnals, it's called the Ausbund, is their hymnal, uh, corresponding number of hymnals are placed on in the front. Each hymnal has a piece of paper in it. On one piece of paper, there's penciled a black dot. And each minister, or each, sorry, each candidate comes up and picks up one of the hymnals. The idea is that God will guide the appropriate candidate to the marked dot on the piece of paper. And that candidate is now the deacon or the minister. There's no forewarning. They go into the service. Services are three hours in length. They go into the service in the morning with no knowledge that they're going to be a minister. They leave having become a minister. It is not always a joyous occasion. There's lots of responsibility being a minister. There is no pay. There is no reward other than being in service to God. So some people actually grieve the fact that they become ministers. Uh, for a bishop, when a bishop opens up, the same process occurs between the two ministers who are then are left, and one of those ministers will become the bishop, and then there's an opening for a minister, and the same process occurs of picking by lot the minister. So that's the way it's usually done. The church regulates dress. When you see Amish people in the way they're dressing, the church will tell them what they can wear. You're more likely to see, for example, pastel shirts on men in Elkhart LaGrange, more likely to see white shirts, although that's changing, in Burning Grable. Uh, when I first started working with the Amish, women pinned. Women did not have buttons, but they actually wore straight pins to keep their clothes together. Men were buttoning. Now I'm seeing women who actually have buttons on their dresses. That's beginning to change, but that's a church by church decision. There's a selective use of technology, as I've said. Um, sometimes they use technology. Sometimes they compromise with what technology they can use. Horse and buggy transportation I've talked about and non-resistance I've also talked about. They don't join the military. During times of the draft, if they're um, drafted, they become conscientious objectors and they will work in areas where they're, they're not serving as um, fighting 
doing conscientious objector work. All right. They are indeed a collective culture. In collective culture, collective society, those are interchangeable terms. But in, the idea is that the group supersedes the individual. So they deny a self-interest for greater good in the community. And as a result, there's a strong emphasis on humility, obedience, and patience. Humility, obedience, and patience become cardinal virtues among the Amish with each other. Not necessarily with us. Um, one of my favorite stories, and I included it in Serving the Amish, this, this young man that I had known for some time and who really, he and I had a very good relationship, were, were talking at one point. And he's, the Amish call anyone who's not Amish English is their, their term for us. And he was talking to me and he said, you know, I really get worried about myself sometimes because sometimes I don't even see English as human. And I said, have you looked at me lately? And he looked over and just kind of stared at me as if he was seeing me for the first time. And then he said, you don't count. And in one sense, it was a tremendous compliment that I had kind of passed the test and I didn't count anymore as English. In another sense, it's classic. Um, you know, if you're part of your culture, you're, and you're ingrained in your culture, you don't see other people as significant. And I think that's what happens a lot of times with the Amish. When, when you look at the humility that they have, the patience they have, and the willingness to be the obedient, that's very much true when it comes to other Amish. It doesn't necessarily hold true outside the culture because we are of the world. Even if we're Christian, which they more are more likely to accept and, and appreciate, we're still of the world, and we don't have the same cachet that someone Amish does. So, okay. Uh, religion, religious ideals are going to reinforce this whole social system. Their purpose for being is the ministry of Jesus Christ. And that's going to reinforce who they are as a culture. The culture is going to reinforce the religious ideals. So that's always important to hang on to. Not only are Amish collective, but they're a high context culture. And I'm gonna let Steve Nolt talk to you for a moment about what a high-context culture is. Because Steve has a good description of high-context. So here he is discussing that. We, um, we usually refer to the Amish as a high-context culture. And in a high context culture, it's important to know a person in many different ways. Um, many of us function in what we call low context culture. So for example, if I go to the drugstore, uh, my interaction with the pharmacist is based on a very narrow slice of information about her. And it can be summed up with a piece of paper that's hanging on the wall which is a license from the state that she is licensed to practice pharmacy and maybe another piece of paper that says where she graduated from pharmacy school. That's all I need to know about her. That's all I want to know about her. And that's all she wants to know about me. In a high context culture, it's important to know about people in a lot of different ways. Um, their credentials, to use that term, is not just in those formal kinds of certification but your credential as a person is also where you grew up, who your parents were, who your extended family is, what kind of a person you are when you're not on the job, where you go to church, where you went to school, um, how you interact with people in, in many ways. And for the Amish, a high context culture is also conveyed through your dress and through your demeanor. So it's important to know how a person dresses, 
and how they conduct themselves. Um, and, and that's, uh, again, for, for Amish folks, that's conveyed in um, their uh, adherence to or resistance to or modifying or tweaking the uh, rules of the church in terms of how they're dressed uh, and in terms of how they uh, comport themselves. Um, traditionally, this is uh, also one of the reasons that um, for a high context culture like the Amish, telephones are uh, problematic. Uh, a telephone abstracts that form of communication. It separates the information and message of the voice from the body, from the place. So when I'm talking to someone on the phone, I don't know where they are. I don't know uh, exactly how they are interacting with the people who are around them. Face-to-face -face communication highlights all those pieces that are so critical to a high context culture um, uh, sort of interaction. And one of the ways that for uh, professionals, I think, professionals working with the Amish, where this uh, can, again, maybe be surprising, is the way in which Amish people are going to be interested in um, who you are as a person apart from your professional credentials. And they may ask about that in ways that um, might seem uh, inappropriate in terms of uh, the, the, the normal way we would understand professional boundaries and confidentiality. And it's not that you have to reveal all that, but, but they may ask about that or they may talk about other people in ways that seem like um, they are uh, not recognizing the different roles and responsibilities that people are in, but that's because they aren't separating people into those different kinds of roles and they don't have the same kind of private, public um, distinctions that, um, that, that the rest of us take for granted, at least in the same way. It's not that, they have, it's not that Amish people have no concept of, of professional boundaries, but, but those lines are often drawn in somewhat uh, different ways and different places. Okay, so Amish culture is collective, high context, and hierarchical. And that's a good lecture question number two. What is Amish culture? Amish culture is collective, high context, and hierarchical. That's what you need to know. The hierarchy in Amish culture is very deeply entrenched. It's not always obvious, but it's there. Once upon a time, my wife and I had an Amish family from Grable and an Amish family from LaGrange here for dinner. Uh, and there was a bishop from Grable in the family. There was a bishop from LaGrange in the family, but the bishop from LaGrange was much older than the bishop from Grable. Um, and all this actually happened about 10 feet to my left here because I'm of where I'm filming at home. But we're sitting in the, the family room and everyone's talking and laughing and it's very informal. And my wife came out and said, dinner is served. And a hush fell over the room and everyone stood up. And I was fascinated to watch that when we went into the dining room, and of course we're letting the guests go first, but the first one to walk into the dining room was the oldest bishop. The next one to walk into the dining room was the other bishop. Following him was his father, the second bishop's father, who was the next male in line. Following them was the next oldest woman, who was the older bishop's wife. And following her was the younger bishop, or follow, sorry, following her was the wife of the second oldest bishop's father. And then we have the wife of the second oldest bishop. And then we have two girls who were the, the granddaughters of, I'm sorry, were the daughters of the second oldest bishop. So it's a very clear hierarchy walking into the dining room. And that was it. Once they sat down, everything was informal, casual again, but in that moment, it was very clear 
who was in charge, who was who was in the hierarchy. Everything was there. All right. Women in Amish culture. Uh, and this is a fascinating issue. Karen Johnson Weiner has a book coming out again in September, October from Johns Hopkins University Press talking about Amish women. And I, I, I've read the, the pre-release version of that. A fascinating book about Amish women. Um, looking at their role, they are submissive, but that submission has a lot of egalitarian quality to it. Uh, they are not really sub under subjection as much as they're under submission. So there are strong Amish women, but they have to be careful because if they're too strong, they can experience what's called unfrida. And unfrida is a, an informal kind of reprimand. It's a cold shoulder that's given by the church, by neighbors, by the community to say, you're not remembering your place. It's very subtle, but it's there. Uh, Unfrida can be given for any number of things. It can be given to men or women. But it's just a reminder that we have ways we expect you to behave, and you're not behaving in those ways. But Amish culture at its best is very caring. And it practices something called Gelassenheit. You don't often hear the Amish themselves talk about Gelassenheit, but it occurs. It's the, it's the philosophy kind of underlying a lot of the best of Amish culture. And I'm gonna let Steve Nolte again talk about Gelassenheit and what Gelassenheit means. One of the, one of the values that we sometimes associate with the Amish is Gelassenheit. Uh, that's not a term that Amish people themselves use very often, but it's a German term that's sometimes translated as uh, yielding or giving oneself over. It could be yielding oneself to the will of God or to the will of the church or even just to the other person that you're interacting with. So it might express itself in a, uh, a reticence to jump into a conversation, but to hesitate, to speak slowly, to wait before um, immediately responding. Uh, more of a, a, a gentle chuckle rather than a, a hearty laugh. Those would be the expressions of, of Galassonites. It's kind of a, this, this corporate Amish personality, but it's often also um, reflected in the individual's personality. And I remember number of years ago taking um, a prominent sociologist from another country who was visiting here in the U.S. and he wanted to uh, talk with some Amish folks and I took him to visit uh, an Amish bishop uh, east of Goshen. And um, the scholar uh, posed a question. It was a good good question. Posed a question and the Amish bishop um, did not immediately respond. He sort of sat there and thinking about it. Of course, I'm thinking, okay, he's, he's taking it, he's going to have a good answer to this, but he's not going to immediately, this is not the, uh, the repartee of the, the seminar room, uh, he's going to wait before he responds. And uh, the scholar interpreted this as, oh, he must not have understood my question. And I mean, I think he was also, he was also generously uh, assuming that maybe the, the language was too advanced or something, I'm not sure. But in any case, he, his immediate response was to, he, the, 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 uh, the, the visiting scholar, was to jump in and say the question again. Uh, at which point um, the bishop, again, doesn't immediately respond. He actually has to size up, oh, was this the same question? And again, pause. And then the scholar immediately jumps in again and reframes. And I thought, I, at a certain point, I just sort of had to, to, to it, was, it was a little awkward, but call a stop to it, because otherwise this man was just going to be doing all the talking. Uh, and would have just been restating the same question over and over again and say, you're not going to get an immediate response. There's, there's going to be a pause, uh, silence, uh, as the, the um, late Amish uh, scholar John A. Hostetler uh, often liked to point out that silence uh, plays a very important role in Amish society uh, in ways that 
um, maybe many of us in, um, shall we say, modern or mainstream society don't uh, recognize. We associate silence with solitude. And the Amish also have an important place for silence uh, among people. And, and silence is an important part of interacting um, with one another. And it's a way of giving space and yielding space to other people. And that can be, um, I suppose, surprising and maybe even um, disconcerting or confusing um, to professionals and others who are interacting with Amish people for the first time. When we discuss culture, we can lose sight of the fact that the Amish are, in point of fact, a form of theocracy. And this schematic gives a sense within the Christian belief system and collective culture of the relative importance of these components. And remember, this is antithetical to our individual beliefs. When we get a client in, we are all about empowering that client. We are all about teaching that client how to stand up for themselves, how to be assertive as an individual, how to encourage their rights. That doesn't work for the Amish. The Amish need to be empowered within the collective. How do I work within my community? How do I stand up as a member of my community? So how do we, how do we manage to empower within the group? That becomes an important consideration. Remember to boundaries in the Amish. Um, we can try to create boundaries all day long, and they won't work. One of the more recent examples, and you may have read about it in the last couple of years, in Adams County, uh, the prosecutor decided that he was going to stop the, the tragedy of midwives acting as doctors, Amish midwives acting as doctors. So he arrested two of the more well-known Amish midwives and charged them with practicing medicine without a license. Big to do in the Amish community. Um, and I've known the prosecutor a long time. I knew what he was planning to do. We talked about, he consulted with me and talked about what he was going to do and what I thought the blowback would be. You know, I shared with him my thoughts about it, but clearly he, felt strongly about this. A couple of children had died at the hands of these midwives. He just felt something had to be done. Okay. So these two midwives are arrested, sentenced, and stopped from acting as midwives in Adams County. Before they were sentenced, I was meeting with an Amish woman in Adams County who told me the name of the new young midwife who was taking over from one of these midwives who was being sentenced, an Amish midwife, took me out, showed me her facility, showed me what it looked like, walked me through, um, everything else. Nothing had changed. It was just another Amish midwife taking over. So we can try to create our boundaries for the Amish. We can try to say this is what we believe should happen that's not going to necessarily change what the Amish do. We need to be aware of that. Um, they won't necessarily fight us directly. They're non-resistant. These two midwives, I'm absolutely sure, have given up being midwives. They will respect the sentence that the court passed, but that doesn't mean someone else hasn't taken their place. And let me just let you listen to some discussion about boundary issues with the Amish. This is Chris Weber, Weber sorry, and Jim Hubert. Um, Chris is a mental health counselor. Jim is a social worker who is retired from a hospital in Pennsylvania. Let me let you listen to them talk. <laughs> 
I end up in this odd place where it's unique to me and to them and it's not counseling the way I normally do it. Um, it gets to me differently. I'm always a counselor with the English. Um, they have a place for me before I come in that fits for them. It's like the dentist. I never have this conversation. I, I have an English client right now where we've worked for three years and she is moving on and she says, I'm going to miss you. And then at the same time she says, but you're not a real friend because I pay you to listen to me. And what happens is at the end of that, at the end of that process, I end up back in the professional role and back in that professional mold where I need to be. That's where the boundary is. The boundaries are different. This is it. The boundaries are different. Um, and I have to redefine. I mean, it's, it's an existential counseling thing, right? Where you talk about creating a new therapy for every client. And I have to create a new therapy for every Amish family I'm working with as well as every client because they don't have in the culture the place for the professional to come in and help the family. They have a place for people to come in and be part of the family. Um, the boundaries are different and it's their boundaries, not mine. And I have to find a way to maintain, educate, and also it's been a huge education for me about the culturally bound expectations I have in my profession about confidentiality, about personal boundaries and everything else. And I have to find a way to be true to that and also meet their needs for someone who is not going to just come in and be unaffected. Uh, a gentleman, uh, we were just talking as I was riding along in the car and I was giving him a ride home and uh, I said, so will the whole family be around the table tonight when you get home for, for dinner? He said, well, yes, and then you could tell he wasn't quite certain about that answer. His oldest son, who still lives at home, would not be at the table. Uh, and uh, was, was able to talk about his, his uh, heartbreak over the fact that this son comes home and often will switch into English clothes and somebody will pick him up and he'll be gone for the evening. And the, and the hurt and the struggle that creates for him. And should he ask his son to leave the house because the other younger children see this and they don't know what to make of it? Uh, or you know, should, should his love extend to the point where it doesn't matter whether he comes and goes in this way? Uh, and, and these are the kinds of things that, that are really hard to, to always know what to, how to respond because uh, so much of it has to do with their, with their culture and with issues that, that, that a lot of people in the English world have thoughts about, but we don't understand very well things like shunning and uh, things of that sort. Uh, another Amish fellow who was in a hospital bed cried and cried and cried. We spent two hours together one day in which he talked about his daughter who uh, uh, went through classes to join the church uh, but was counseled by the leadership to wait after the classes were over and not join when her friends did their feeling was that she was not quite ready and uh, she took that opportunity to leave the Amish uh, community and as he said went English uh, and uh, you know he he had feelings about it partly because you know how much did he and his wife contribute to this matter that his daughter is faced with and on the other hand how much of it might have been the way the leadership dealt with her, uh, and uh, then she, he went on to say that she hooked up with an English fella and you know had had a family and 
uh, things weren't going so well that way either. But how, uh, despite the some of the judgment that, that befell her on the part of the community, uh, as far as he was concerned, it was still their daughter, and uh, he felt you know very close to her. I think about the times that, uh, especially as relationships have developed. And close, I guess you'd say, in a way, uh, that, that, that uh, Amish folk would share with me in a way that, that uh, almost crosses a boundary in, in the sense that they're sharing with an English person something that's very vital to their innermost self kind of thing, you know, something that, uh, that maybe they wouldn't feel comfortable sharing uh, with another Amish person from the standpoint of being judged or from the standpoint of, of it uh, revealing a, a fear or a, uh, a concern, maybe even anger, uh, over something that's going on either within the community or within the family. When you think back to the first lecture that I gave on the foundations of mental health, and I talked about morals, ethics, and legalities. That has tremendous application with the Amish. Uh, believe me, you will find it coming up with the Amish more than any other group, I truly believe. How you are able to apply that will depend in part, in large part, on your organization and how your organization allows you to do it. Um, several years ago, I wrote a vignette for a book with a series of vignettes on ethical conundrums that come up. But the, the title of the vignette was, of course it's confidential, only the community knows. And the story was about an Amish man who had sexually offended against his daughters that I was seeing and doing counseling with. Um, he asked me, I had met with him several times, met with his wife several times, and he asked me if I would be willing to meet with his bishop and his ministers and his deacon and explain to them what was going on because they had concerns about him and he wanted me to share with them what was happening in his treatment. Now, technically I should get consents to release information for this, but he's Amish. Okay. So I don't worry about the releases because that's a very English thing. It's his, it's to protect him. It's not really to protect me. He's never going to sue me. So, okay. So I meet with the bishop, the ministers, the deacon. They have some excellent questions about his behavior, the risk he poses, what I would suggest for the future, you know, interventions, what they can do to support him. Everything goes really well when I meet with them alone. He's not there. I meet with them alone and come back and report to him what's happened and he's pleased. And several weeks later, he says, you know, that went so well. I would really like you to meet with my church and talk with my church about my sexual offense. And I said, how many people are we talking about? He said, oh, about 40, 45. And he genuinely wanted me, and his wife approved, his wife agreed as well, to meet with every adult member of his church and discuss his sexual offense. And I said, what's off limits? And he said, nothing. You can tell him anything. And he was dead serious. Again, something I would never do with a non-Amish person who had sexually offended. It went beautifully. Um, church members had questions, had understandable questions, had understandable fears, and it's something I've done a couple of times since with other Amish who have sexually offended, and it works very well. Do I have releases to consent, consent to release information for all those church members? No. Uh, 
because that's not what the Amish are about. That would be unnecessary, frivolous. That would just be filling out paperwork that has absolutely no import for them. Um, so is it legal? Probably not. Is it ethical? I think so. Is it moral? Definitely. But that's an example of the kinds of things that come up when you're dealing with the Amish. Let's talk about male and female again a minute, coming back to this because it's probably going to be the most uncomfortable aspect of Amish culture for most people today. This whole male trumps female is, is a biblical perspective. The idea that men are in a position to take care of women, to make the final decisions, to be in a position of authority, that is a cultural issue for the Amish. Again, as I've said before, respecting versus accepting. I can respect their view without accepting it. And that's what I have to do when it comes to their view on submission of women. I have said that to them, that I respect your view. I don't accept it. All I ask you to do is respect my view that I am egalitarian in my view of women, that I see women as equal to me, but I don't ask you to accept it. But please respect the fact that that's what I believe. And we're okay from there. What about former Amish? Former Amish present a special problem. They are in a twilight land because they're not English but they're not Amish either. Because of their history, uh, because of their, their background, they understand the Amish in a way that we don't. Uh, but they don't understand our culture. One of, I mentioned Joe Whitmer earlier. Uh, Joe Whitmer was the one who, when I was talking about trauma, had not been able to pick milkweed pods and, and felt really uh, bullied and, and tormented because of that when he was a child during World War II. Uh, one of the things that's different, Joe, again, grew up as Amish, didn't grow up with a television, and never really watched television when he was younger. So, or never watched television as an adult, he just had no interest in television because he didn't grow up with it. One time, I was talking about this particular town that I went through, and I was making reference to the fact that it reminded me of the Twilight Zone. And if you're young enough, you don't remember the Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone was um, a TV show where people got into these very bizarre situations that were um, unusual and horrific and left them feeling like they weren't with reality. And they always started with Rod Serling standing to the side of the screen smoking a cigarette. And Rod Serling would narrate what was about to happen. And so I said to Joe, because Joe was a little bit older than I was, when, whenever I drive into this town, I always expect to look to the side of the road and see Rod Serling standing there. And Joe looked at me puzzled and said, who's Rod Serling? And I said, Twilight Zone? He said, what's the Twilight Zone? I had no idea. Famous TV show from our childhood. But he had no idea what I was talking about. You know, again, if you, if you talk with people who are former Amish, it's not at all unusual to find those kind of gaps in their cultural history things that are missing that you would anticipate are there, but, but they really aren't because they grew up Amish. All right. There are two primary ways to leave the Amish. It's called jumping the fence, is the kind word for it. Here in Indiana, the, the more derogatory name for it is called jerkovers. Out in Pennsylvania and Ohio, it's called yankovers. But the, the idea, as you can see, is the idea that somehow they're pulled over the fence, jerked over, yanked over, 
more derogatory term to be honest, but, but the Amish use it quite frequently. If you leave after becoming a member of the church, there is usually a period of shunning. Now up in Elkhart LaGrange, if you, if you leave, there's usually a period of shunning, but if you join a church, like a Mennonite church, there's several churches up there composed of former Amish, then it's acceptable. Then it's okay, and you're kind of accepted back into fellowship. Down here, if you leave, even if you join another church, you're not really supposed to be in fellowship with anyone Amish. But there's a tendency to look the other way if it's a family member. Uh, but the, the excommunication is much stronger among the Swiss Amish. If you leave before you've joined the church, if you leave during Rumspringa, you know, you turn 16, Rumspringa is the time of running around and making the decision to join. And by the way, Rumspringa down here among Swiss Amish lasts about a year or less. Usually about 17 people have joined. Up in Elkhart and LaGrange, that can last into your early 20s. But if you leave before you've joined the church, you have not violated your baptismal vows. And it's still seen as a failure on the part of the family to keep a member in the church, but it's not looked at with the same kind of uh, shame that it's looked at as if you join the church and then leave. So leaving before joining the church doesn't involve excommunication or shunning. Right. Former Amish vary in how they see the church. Some are very bitter. Some are very angry with the Amish church. Uh, others are very defensive of their former way of life, very supportive of the Amish. So it, it depends. You can find people who just are really angry and others who say, you know what, it's a great system, but it just wasn't for me. But either way, often there's an emotional attachment to being Amish. They never completely leave the church. So you'll find that there. And I'm going to let Steve Nolt again talk about some of the changing attitudes that occur. I think popular uh, attitudes towards the Amish, towards Amish society generally and Amish people uh, in, as individuals has changed over the years and talking with older Amish people over the course of the last 25 years as I've talked with uh, older Amish folks have you know, tapped into some memories that, that uh, go back quite a number of decades. One of the broad patterns is that um, Amish people recognize that there is a more positive public perception of Amish society today than would have been the case uh, in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, and I've heard that from people in Pennsylvania and Ohio and Indiana and in other places. I don't think it's just um, specific to a particular uh, settlement. But uh, the idea that um, Amish people were, um, were dumb, they were stupid, they were um, resisting modernity, um, that uh, the, the, the 1950s not sending your children to high school, for example, um, not mechanizing agriculture. So the 1950s, this is the era of the interstate highway system and the gearing up of the space race to respond to Sputnik, and people who aren't hooking up to the grid and who are using horse and buggies instead of tractors. Um, these are people who are uh, standing against the, um, the, the irresistible forces of Western progress. And so there was, there was uh, quite a bit of prejudice against um, Amish people uh, generally, or Amish society and Amish values generally. Um, by the 1970s, I think in the midst of um, uh, the energy crisis, um, the beginnings of the environmental movement, um, books like Small is Beautiful, and, and other things in the 1970s, suddenly the Amish, rather than being seen as people who were behind the times, were seen as people who were maybe ironically ahead of the times. Now, some of that interpretation um, no doubt uh, idealized Amish life and, and took it in, in a bit of a different direction than the Amish themselves, didn't necessarily understand themselves as uh, proto-environmentalists, but, but there was, there was a, this change in wider society in the 1970s. There was the, 
the uh, revival of interest in um, in folk art and in fabric art, and suddenly Amish quilts became very popular in the 1970s, for example. So all different aspects of Amish society that uh, seemed to be um, appealing, or at least something that um, the rest of us might learn something from, or that wasn't going away. I think if we go to the late 20th century, early 21st century, um, in academic circles, in 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 with, with a more of a postmodern understanding. Uh, that, that would uh, critique the whole modernization project of the 20th century. Uh, the fact that here were a group of people who dissented from modernism all along is uh, something that's intriguing and that, um, that we don't just dismiss out of hand. Having said all that, I think at a local level, um, there still often persists particular um, prejudices uh, against um, uh, against Amish society or, or Amish communities and whether that is framed in terms of people who are um, freeloaders, they don't pay taxes, which isn't true, but this is part of the part of the, um, uh, the narrative. The Amish don't participate in Social Security or in some states in workers' compensation if they're self-employed, but they do pay property tax uh, inheritance tax, sales tax, all other taxes, uh, income tax as they apply. Uh, but there is this perception that the Amish aren't paying taxes and they're receiving these services and they're, and they're, they're uh, freeloaders. Um, there's the perception in some places that um, uh, the Amish, uh, Amish buggies are, and horses are tearing up the roads um, and they're not, um, they're, they're not contributing via voting or civic participation in a way that compensates for um, and then, I think, frankly, in some places there are there's just a prejudice against the Amish because their their first language is not English and they're different and they seem standoffish in some settings in some contexts. They dress differently, um, and um, so that's that that also is is in some places part of the the uh, the anti Amish prejudice. Um, one other very particular way that that uh, negative uh, image shows up would be in certain Amish communities, larger Amish communities in which there is uh, a sizable ex-Amish population. So individuals who grew up in Amish homes but didn't join the Amish church. Um, those individuals, depending upon the terms uh, which they um, left that, uh, that faith heritage, um, some folks have remained on very good terms with their Amish family and others have not. And um, it's quite understandable for those who have not that they would uh, harbor some uh, ill will. Um, and, and in some places that, that has become part of um, those, those stories, unfortunate as they are, uh, have become part of the, um, uh, part of the local lore about, about the Amish. Okay, so how do we make sense of all this? Well, we look at Amish culture and we think of their inconsistencies. But what about us? We spend money and time on gym equipment and then we buy riding lawnmowers. We long for time with our families. We feel like we don't have enough. And then we move long distances away from those same family members. And Don Crable wrote the riddle of Amish culture to address the paradoxes of Amish life. And really Don talks about some of these paradoxes. So let me just let Don speak to some of that in his voice. The best way to solve the riddle and to understand Amish culture is to think about how they negotiate with modernity. On the one hand, they're really holding on to certain traditional practices, yet at the same time, um, to succeed financially, they have to change their uh, practices and be willing to use some modern technology that otherwise they wouldn't have. So there's this continued negotiation 
And it's not just about technology, it's about education. Um, well, uh, we won't go to public high schools, but we'll, we'll set up our own private schools. Uh, they're still under the state control, but they're going to operate them. We won't work in big factories, and I know northern Indiana is an exception, but for most communities, they don't want to work in an outside English place. Well, we'll set up our own shops and we'll operate them the way we want to, uh, but we will leave the farm. So there's always this continual negotiation, and I find that lens a really helpful way uh, to figure out exactly what's going on and to understand uh, how the Amish go about uh, finding their way in this, uh, as they're navigating the turbulent waters of modernity, so to speak. Each, each settlement, each affiliation, each little congreg each little church district, they work out their own, uh, they have their own negotiations with modernity for the particular issues. And, uh, some of them don't make sense to us from the outside world, and uh, uh, others do. Uh, but there's always this continual, you know, adaptation and negotiation, and it's the dynamic of that that I think uh, is, for me, very, very interesting and very fascinating. But it's a dynamic different than what we do. Not really. We all negotiate. Uh, I mean, uh, as mainstream modern people, we all negotiate to a certain extent. But I do think that concept, um, and it's one thing I'm somewhat critical about Hostetter, he was focused on the folk society, how the Amish are a folk society, and it gives the impression that they're sort of, um, you know, antiques on, a, on the shelf of a museum, it, the sense that there's not much social change, that they're, they're kind of their own little society that doesn't interact a lot with the outside world, and that's maybe being overly critical. But I do think this negotiating with modernity is a dynamic concept, and so things are always changing. And that's why you can't predict the future, and you can't predict Amish technology in the future, because it'll always be renegotiated. I had this wonderful experience last week on a field trip with my students. Um, this was uh, September of 2014. So we went into a, an Amish lantern shop. I knew the owner of it, and I hadn't been there for about 15 years. And he was explaining all the stages they had gone through um, in his shop, uh, developing different nozzles for propane gas lanterns and the, the various steps that they'd gone through over the last 20 years. Well, then he introduced us to his 25-year-old son and his son, he said, my son works with 3D printers, 3D printers. I'd never seen one ever in my life before. So uh, we went upstairs and he said, here they are. He had a bank of eight 3D printers. Mm -hmm. He said, we run them uh, 624. We don't run them on Sunday. We, we run them 624. Negotiation here. And what he is doing is he, he's a very bright, very smart, self-educated, 24, 25 year old young man um, who is manufacturing a, a molding that connects uh, a, a, an LED light to an assortment of different batteries. Uh, they have a standard connection, but a lot of the customers want to use different kinds of batteries. So he's manufacturing these as fast as he can. He created the design. I mean, he was the, the R&D <laughs> chief to figure out what to do. Um, and he said, I actually got these uh, printers cheaper, these 3D printers, because they're an earlier generation and I don't need something as sophisticated as the current generation of 3D printers because it would be too expensive. But the ingenuity uh, here, the creativity, the inventiveness, uh, with only an eighth grade education where there was actually no technology at all in his classroom, in the schoolhouse for the first eight grades. It's just amazing. Just amazing uh, the kind of uh, creativity, inventiveness, uh, hacking uh, that they're doing. And the only reason that whole shop exists, the lantern shop, in all these generations, it exists only for one purpose and that is to figure out how to get adequate light because we won't use electricity off of the public uh, grid. If they had been using electricity off the public grid, there'd be no need for any of this.
So the fascinating thing here is that you have a culture of restraint, a culture of restraint that restricts, in this case, electricity from the outside world. But that culture of restraint stimulates and sparks innovation. So you have this paradox, this culture of restraint that is sparking and uh, becomes a catalyst for creativity and innovation. So what are the pros and cons of being Amish? What are the positive and, positives and negatives to both Amish life and modernity? A few pros of modernity, look at the strides we've made in human rights. We, we have made strides, although it sometimes doesn't feel like it, but civil rights for all peoples. We have come much farther than ever before in the history of this country, in the history of the world in recent history, um, encouraging people's civil rights. Prosperity, again, we go back and forth, we have recessions, we have depressions, but we have achieved a level of prosperity for more people worldwide than has ever been true before. Ultra convenience in terms of communication and technology, transportation, we have unimagined abilities in our convenience. An individual choice, the freedom and the selection that we have was not even conceived of a generation ago. What are the cons in terms of modernity? Well, alienation. More people express isolation and loneliness than ever before. Stress, workloads increasing, anxiety increasing, homelessness, not in the literal sense, but more people who can't identify a geographic area, a, a hometown, a, someplace they call their own. More people who are rootless. How about the pros of being Amish? There's belonging. There is a sense of group cohesion in being Amish that we don't experience. There is protection from cradle to grave. If something happens and you need someone to be there, someone is there. There's never any question about that. Um, woman whose husband died tragically in an accident, church was there, cared for her, provided support for her financially in every way she needed until her children were grown and could begin to care for her themselves. She had support. You know, there wasn't any need for social security. There wasn't any need for other family members to step in. Um, if there is a medical need, there was a bishop in the burn area whose child was born with severe heart malformation. Over a million dollars in medical care at Riley. Churches throughout the United States pitched in and helped pay for that medical care. That's the kind of support that occurs. What are the cons? Limited options. It's hard to buck the system. If you're Amish, you're going with the flow, period. There is groupthink. It's, it's hard to have freedom of thought. It's hard to be creative. You can be creative in specific areas of technology or how to compromise with modernity, but not in a lot of areas. No encouragement of creativity. There's limited freedom. Uh, if you stretch the envelope too much, you're disciplined. So in terms of working with the Amish, this is the culture. This is where they're coming from. This is who they are. And in terms of applying the principles of mental health, in terms of applying the, the techniques and the skills that you have, remember that these are people who need to be part of a larger system. They do not need to think individually. Women do not need to be empowered to take an egalitarian role. 
they need to be part of a cohesive group. And anything you do in terms of treatment needs to facilitate that role as part of a cohesive group. Okay? Good luck, take care, and I'll see you next time.